Okay, so we are looking at Mark Simonich's The U.S. Civil War, which I believe was published in 2015. I picked it up in 2015, actually in December, and I uh, haven't had a chance to play it very much, but it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a little bit of a monster. It's two different boards you see here, one next to the other, and uh, I don't even have a piece of glass big enough to put the entire thing under at once, so hopefully we don't have any hex uh, any counters falling off uh, because of the, the glass lines travel to hex or something like that. Uh, so I'm playing through uh, a solo game here. I've only played the 1861 scenario, and I p tried playing a solo game all the way through in December, but I just never got all the way through it, and time and other uh, uh, tasks got in the way. I ended up putting it up and not recording the situation of the board, but I also didn't have a very good understanding of the rules when I was first playing through, so kind of wanted to start over anyway. So what you see on the board here is the position after the first turn, the summer one, uh, 1861 turn. Uh, I'll go over what the situation of the board is after that first turn in another video, but here I just wanted to uh, address some of the uh, criticisms, I suppose, that have been applied to the game. Uh, certainly everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and I may, I may find as I play through that I come to share some of those opinions that have been expressed, but um, I was initially drawn to this game because it's just gorgeous. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's not the typical kind of game that I would play. In fact, when I started getting back into games in 2015, I really didn't think that I would ever buy a Hex Encounter war game, but um, I did. Uh, and it really sort of got me into the hobby a little bit deeper, and now I've got some more that I've been playing since, and I haven't had a chance to come back to the U.S. Civil War, but here we are. So there have been a few uh, criticisms that the game is unbalanced, that the Confederate player essentially, uh, his position is hopeless, and the rejoinder that I've seen to that is that historically the Confederate player's position was kind of hopeless. It would have been very difficult for the Confederate states to have actually won a decisive military uh, prolonged campaign against federal determined, at least determined federal troops. And so the way that the South is often understood to have had a path to win this war in other Civil War board game iterations is that there was a significant political aspect to the game as well. And that's the primary route that the Southern player would have to exploit to try to bring about uh, a positive end of the war. Um, this game, I look a little more on it like the ending victory conditions in um, Empire of the Sun, which is to say that as the Southern player, you don't have to win an automatic victory. You just have to not lose. You, you win by not losing. You win by not uh, uh, unconditionally surrendering like Grant had to do, right? So you have to last, you just have to last through 1865 with, without giving up those, those 60 victory points. And there are a number of different ways that you could do that, I suppose, but uh, the approach that I am taking with the Confederate side in this game is to be very cautious. Um, we'll see if that holds out, if that's really a tenable strategy, uh, if Confederate uh, forces are, are really sort of waning and Federalist forces are really on the rise by the end of the game, it might just be an, an unquenchable tide of, of Northern troops. I don't know, we'll have to see. Um, I have adopted a couple of house rules in this game, some that have been proposed by others, and one that I don't know if I just made it up myself. Well, I guess I did make it up myself, but, you know, I, I'm probably not the first person to do it. Uh, and these rules are intended to address the sort of inherent imbalance in, um, in power, I guess? I don't know. I don't know if they're better or not, but I'm playing with them. Uh, the first is I've adopted in the rulebook there is a naval transport suggestion for the 1861 start scenario which is that uh, naval power from both sides sort of slowly ramps up over the course of 1861. So in the very first turn, there weren't actually any naval transport capacity available to either side of the war. So you'll notice that there are no federal troops on any, any of these southern uh, ports or fortresses that or islands that, that may have, you know, normally it's sort of a no-brainer to to take out one of those places, take out one of those islands like the Hatteras Inlet or something, to uh, degrade the the blockade level to to interfere with uh, CSA build points. Um, 
so that wasn't a possibility on the first turn. Uh, now that they're in the second turn, I think the naval transport capacity is one. Uh, but I've adopted another rule, not in the rule book, another house rule, which suggests that the ability of the federal troops to supply forces entirely through uh, ocean ports is dependent upon the resource value of those ports. So that if there is one or no resource value, you can only fully supply three federal strength points through a port. And if it's a, a strength value, or if it's a, a resource value of two, then you can get six. And if it's three, you can get 18. You know, it works the same way as the stars on the generals and that term, how it, how it ramps up. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I know a lot of people felt that it was something of an exploit that the, uh, the, the federal player was able to sort of invade the southern coast at various points and um, really cut up the uh, the south in a, in a somewhat ahistorical way. Now, it was historical that the federal forces did hold beachheads in a number of places and limited zones of control around them during the war. Um, another house rule that I've adopted is... Uh, the the on to Richmond rule, which is to, if the dice differential in this game, I, I, I didn't intend this to be an explanation of the rules, but at the beginning of each turn, the beginning of each action cycle, both sides roll a die, and the difference is going to be, you do this four times during your action cycle, four different phases, and the difference between the die roll is going to indicate related to how many action points or how many activations you get in an action phase, and there are four phases of each cycle, and both sides uh, undertake all of their uh, action points, all of their activations before the next side does. Uh, so it's a little bit unpredictable exactly who's going to have the initiative. You might get sort of two action phases in a row uh, between these different action cycles, between these two different action phases. Sorry, not trying to confuse the terminology. Uh, you'll see how that works, I guess, as we play out. If I do the actual gameplay, I might just do end of turn sort of recaps of what happened. There are a lot of uh, good videos out there that show you how this game works and how the gameplay actually flows. So I was going to say the other uh, house rule that I've adopted is related to on to Richmond. If there's a dice differential of four or five, so basically if you have a lot of um, capacity to get things done in an action phase, the Union has to spend at least one of those points attacking a hex in Pennsylvania, Maryland, or Virginia, assuming that those hexes are under uh, Confederate control, of course. So if they don't do that, then they're penalized, they lose a strength point, and they lose an action phase, uh, or an activation in an action phase. So I've adopted another rule, which is to say that a dice differential of three, four, or five requires the same uh, action. So it just becomes a little more uh, restrictive for the federal player. He's a little more committed to pushing on to Richmond. And I think the effect of that early on is going to be to limit his effectiveness which is a, um, a criticism of the game that the federal player is a little bit too maneuverable early in the game and a little bit too, uh, uh, I don't know, that it's a little unbalanced that way. So we'll have to see as the game goes on how these rules impact the gameplay. I also know that there is a renovated rule set coming out in September. I don't have the patience to wait for that. And I, I doubt that the... Um, Rules are going to be too far different from the March, uh, sort of most recent rule set that's up now, and the the March um, errata that goes along with it. So uh, I hope you stay with the video, stay with the channel, and see what a mess I can make of the U.S. Civil War.